I get a lot of questions about machine knitting socks, so let's do it now. This is an absolutely classic example of machine knitted socks. We'll be knitting it on the Brother Bulky, the 260. I'm using a worsted weight, otherwise known as number four yarn, wool with some nylon. This is a classic sock blend. But this weight of yarn makes thick socks, like boot socks. They won't normally fit in your dainty little flats, and certainly not pumps. This is mainly intended as a technique video, but here's the size the socks will come out. If they happen to fit you, go for it. If this is not your size or gauge, you can find in my book Sock and Nations numbers that will allow you to make them in any size and gauge. This ribbing is very springy and it pulls in to only five inches in circumference, but they are to fit a foot bigger around than that. With that in mind, we'll need the cast on to be very, very stretchy, and you'll see me doing a special one that I like for this purpose. Here you can see that skinny, skinny ribbing is very stretchy. The can circumference is 13 inches around. Therefore, if your calf is no larger than 13 inches and you want to make knee socks, you can simply knit extra rows of ribbing. Throughout the video, I will be changing these settings on both bits. Some of the time will be partial knitting. And you can't see me do that when it's off to the right. So that's what I'll be doing. If you have a different brand of machine, set it so that it will knit one way and not the other for the tubular portion of the sock. In the particular yarn that I'm using, which is a wool blend, um, wool plus nylon, for the ribbing I'm using stitch size 2 and for the main knitting stitch size 3. This is a number 4 yarn and I would normally knit it much looser, but I like my sock, sock fabrics firm. In order to get a really true match, and this kind of yarn creates a faux fair isle look without any floats, it's very cool, I must begin at exactly the same place in the color repeat. And I've already pulled it out, watched the colors repeating, and determined where I should start, which is at the beginning of this gray section. So I have knotted myself a loop there to begin with. I'm going to start at the left side and do the double E wrap cast on, which is under two, back over the first one, and pull a true stitch through. I want true stitches on each needle so that I will be able to hang the comb and weights that I want to use immediately and go straight into ribbing. I also want this cast on because it is very, very stretchy, and I need that since this sock top pulls in to only five inches around, and it's to fit an eight inch around foot, so it needs to stretch. On across I go. Now, you may use your river comb, but if so, you would have cast on differently. I want to use these because they're easier for me to get off and on when I need to for the heel and because I want to go straight from this double e-wrap cast on to ribbing. So I'll need to overlap them a little bit. Two don't really fit but one isn't enough. I'm skipping the first two, transferring the next two to the ripper. Same all the way across, except we'll end with one knit stitch on the main bed. The size that I'm making, if you're getting five stitches, seven rows per inch as I am, will fit a size six and a half to seven foot. So if that's what you happen to be knitting for, you get a bonus. This is really a technique video. That is where my combs overlapped. You can see it made my stitch very tight and it took a spare finger to make it available. 
same deal there. And after this, it should be straight across. This is really about the technique of making classic socks on a knitting machine. And so it can be applied to a number of patterns. This is most like the patterns in my book, Sockinations. That's where I'm taking it from. <clears throat> the first main big pattern in Sockinations is for number one weight sock yarn. But then there is a fill in the blank pattern and a huge chart of every likely gauge and sock size to allow you to do the same thing with any yarn for anybody. Okay, ready for the ribbing. Carriage is set at the ribbing stitch size and to knit normally. Expect that first row to be a little tough if you do what I did with the combs, but as you see it worked okay. And now I'm going to knit 56 rows. You knit what you want. Okay, I've done my 56 rows. Just out of curiosity, let's see where we are in the color pattern here. And oh joy, I'm in the right place. Now this is where my advice is going to diverge a little from classic advice. Most patterns would say transfer all stitches to the main bed, and that is what I used to do. But that makes it very hard for you to grab hold of the stitches you need to have to turn later. And I've discovered it works just as well to transfer them to the front bed now. So we'll transfer all to the front bed. Then another optional little thing. I'm going to knit two plain rows. Only one is actually needed, but I'd rather end up on the right and a second plain row won't hurt anything. The reason for that is all the stitches will then be facing the same direction. Even though I'm transferring them, they're not facing the same direction now. They're a little bit easier to pick up and turn on your stitch holders when they are facing the same direction. I'm about to get out of your line of sight, but I only have a couple more to go, so I'll just keep going. You know what I'm doing over here. At this point, too, I like to double check that my combs are still pulling down because I am about to stress the machine by doing what I'm planning to do. I need to go up to my main stitch size on the river bed. You can't see it. It's off to the right, but I just rotated my dial up to three. The thing is, the machine wasn't really designed, not Japanese machines, for you to knit with the river as the main bed. But we've got these nice weights on here. It should do okay. It's only two rows. One, two, and voila, it did fine. At this point, we need to move 10 stitches. Well, actually, first, I need to decrease the one extra stitch because my um, ribbing is complete, and that's all I needed it for. Then we need to pick up 10 stitches on each side and rotate them and put them across from the riverbed stitches so that we can do our circular knitting. I'm going to use this. But before we do that, this yarn tail, Either we can unknit these last 10 so that the yarn tail is coming out from here, which will be the new edge of the bed, or we can snip it, leave a tail, and weave it in later, which is what I'm going to do this time. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. But I only need 10, and that is because a quarter of the stitches in use, 40 stitches, is 10. So these are the ones. All I'm going to do is catch the hooks of 10 of them, leaving two off to the left side. For some reason, I'm having a terrible time lining them up. And take however long it takes 
to make sure each, there we go, each of these prongs is indeed in a hook. I'm going to pull up so all of the stitches went behind latches and pushed down. Now it's very elegant to do this with one flick of the wrist, but it also, until you get super expert, allows mistakes to happen. So you may want to do something less elegant and more secure. Gradual nudging as I just did. Free them. And now I'm going to hang this on the gate pegs just to hold it for a minute while I drop the beds. I could have dropped the beds already to tell you the truth. Okay, don't lose anybody. Now I left my weights on till now, but remember they're straight and rigid and I need to fold the fabric. So here comes one of them off laid out to the side. The one that's down here, it's not in my way yet. I need to make sure that I don't do what I just did. I accidentally hooked part of the fabric I lifted on one of the empty needles. So let's push those out of the way. This needle is holding the stitch that adjoins this stitch. I can push these up if I want to. They're a little bit in the way, but they also are much less likely to drop their stitches as I do this. Now I'm setting the stitches so they align exactly with the ones that remain on the river bed or the front bed if you're using another kind of machine. Because for tubular knitting we want them to align. Now my two empty prongs picked up needles but it doesn't matter as long as I get all ten of these on needles. I used my heel grip and I hung it on these stitches, my heavy fork actually, just to try to keep control of them since I had to take the weight off these. It can help to make sure that each latch is open before you try to match your tool up. So they are open. Now I will try to hook the tool. It helps to look at it from more than one angle. Straight on you can miss it. So I turned my head and I'm looking from over here a little bit and I can tell it's good. Get all the needles behind the latches. Push down so that they all go onto the tool. Get those down and out of the way and rotate. There's a yarn tail. It's really not in the way. And we'll tuck it between the two beds when we get done with this. Everybody's almost aligned. Now they are aligned. These two overlapping prongs. Really not likely to be a problem, but I'm going to go ahead and engage them with those needles so that the tool will rotate into the right position. They won't dump a stitch on the needle. Almost lost them. There we go. I was looking at something else which you cannot afford to do. Rotate the tool. Voila! With everything aligned for the tubular knitting, I need to get some weights on, so I'll reach under and do that. If I can get it on now, I'll put the fork right here. It may be a couple more rows before I can. I got it, but it's not all that secure. 
time to set the carriages to the stockinette stitch size and the part buttons or whatever allows you to knit tubular make sure that if I push in the right part button on the main band I engage the left one on the ripper so with it set like this it'll knit main bed going left river bed going right and of course remember to thread your yarn back into the carriage and now let's try knitting those first few tubular rows one two that's like a good look as this one goes by we should see the main bed knit and we did and the front bed knit and we did now it's time to knit the heel so make sure you've got a weight positioned right here and one reason for these rows we just knitted is that it makes it easier to hang my fork or anything you're going to use now I've got a couple of rows to catch in it here's another little thing that may or may not be in the pattern I'm now going to knit four rows on the counter which is only two tubular rows because each row is half of the whole circumference of the sock if that's not in the pattern and you want to do it before the heel you can safely add it because it won't really make any difference to the pattern I've lowered the front bed which you wouldn't normally do so that you can see that's hung in there the reason is we're about to knit the heel none of the front bed stitches will be knitting these will start not knitting so the length is going to be developing here that's how we make the heel fit us but that means that this area will get looser and looser and try to pop off the needles unless we counteract that tendency in some way so that's why the weight in the center I'll close back up and we'll do it now we come to the sock heel and I have to tell you something first of all we're going to do it twice this one is a bogus heel it's got an alternate yarn threaded onto the machine and I'm going to do it for you before I show you the actual heel that was knitted onto the sock this is because where I'm pointing are big beautiful windows that give me plenty of light unfortunately yesterday while filming the actual sock the sun came out and shone directly in here and made a glare across here that I didn't realize I could see fine while I was actually knitting but the film is bad however I walked you through the process very sensibly so I'm going to leave that in the movie and now we're going to do it before you see that in a more visible easier to see way it's not going to hurt you to hear it described twice because this is the part that gives people the most trouble with sock knitting so let's do it together knowing that this is not the real heel but it is like the real heel and you will be doing it again for the real sock and let's come over here we'll be putting needles in the hold so we need to engage that or the levers on your machine that cause it to happen we've been doing some circular knitting so some of the part buttons were engaged but we don't want them engaged now because we'll be going back and forth on the heel however on the ribber we don't want anything going on now in this example I don't have any real stitches on the ripper but in real life on the real heel I would so you would want both part buttons up these 20 stitches are our heel first I'm going to do a little bit of a dry run the normal way of doing short rowing is perfectly fine for any of my patterns it involves putting a needle in hole, knitting across, wrapping that needle, putting a needle in hold, always on the side away from the carriage for traditional short rowing. 
knitting across and wrapping that needle. The wrap is because when we knit back, there will have been two rows knitted on this needle without anything else going on, and that would make a little hole right next to the held needle. We don't want that in socks. It can be a design feature in something like a shawl, but certainly not here. Since this is not a real sock, I can mix the two methods for demonstration purposes. So we'll put another one in hold opposite the carriage, knit across, and wrap. Now what I really prefer to do is the automatic wrap. Sometimes I do both at once to make a really sturdy heel. I'm going to have to reach under at this point because I feel that my weights are not adequately pulling down. Now I can see they're holding down a little bit better. We'll do one more than the traditional way. Place it in the hold on the side away from the carriage. Knit across. Wrap the nearest held needle. Now we're going to move to the automatic wrap. The reason that you don't want to mix these in any one project doing part automatic wrap and part standard is that they don't look quite alike. I didn't put this in hold before knitting across. Now I will. I don't have to do any other wrapping because the effect of placing it in the hold after knitting across, you can see the yarns coming up from the side away from the heel stitches that are still working and it has a really similar effect. For those of you who hand knit this is the machine knitting equivalent of German short ropes. Now I may not tell you every time that I do it, but I'm continually reaching my hands underneath and fiddling with the weights to make sure they're still pulling down. Or sometimes I add a little extra pull with my hand by grabbing onto one. I was going to try to show you. See it go down? That's because I not only moved it, I tugged on it. So for this particular sock, we're going to short row down to six stitches. It could be a different number depending on your yarn and size of sock. You see me just barely getting by with that. It knitted, but it's clearly time to move these weights around towards the center. What have we got going on? Eight stitches still knitting. So two more to go into hold. Knit. And into hold. Knit. And into hold. On this shortest row, after placing this stitch in the hold, because it was done after we knitted the row, we push one opposite the carriage back into work on the same row. Knit, and we just keep repeating that. Away from the carriage, one goes back to work. It's clearly time to move my weights. Do you see those stitches trying to crawl up? We can't have that. The main problem people have with short rowing is not realizing how much that's happening. One gets on the many other things that this process involves and you fail to pay attention to what's going on here and stitches seem to fly off the needles without warning. But you actually did have warning. I'm warning you now. I'm pulling down a little bit to help with that. And now you see why the advantage of having these long handled heavy forks. Because I've got to reach up between the beds. I'm not exactly a long lanky person. That's putting it really, really gently. I have short arms. Without this extra reach. I would never be able to just slide under 
and correctly place this weight as I just did. This is back to work and ready to go. And of course, back to work means putting it in an upper working position. The carriage can hang it from there. Now, if this were a real sock, we would resume circular knitting, going round and round. But since it is a mock sock for demonstration purposes only, I will knit a few rows, drop it off the machine, and show it to you. And here we are. A nice, well-defined heel shape. These fit me very well. Now, I short rowed down to six stitches. I have, um, I don't know exactly how you would describe it, but a very defined heel shape. And I like to get it narrow down here and have plenty of depth here because I also have a high instep. And this is contributing to the instep height. Some people with wider heels in less instep height proportionate to their feet, not necessarily less altogether, really would prefer with 20 to short row down to only eight stitches. So that would be fewer rows along here, more width across here. Just something to consider when you are ready to get fancy. In all of my books, including Sockinations, I have figured the most mathematically correct number of short rows for feet of average proportions. And that's what you get. They are not identical from size and gauge to size and gauge because it isn't possible. Sometimes you need to knit part of a stitch and you cannot do so. So I had to round up or down. But that's what the charts in Sockinations reflect is the short rowing sequence most likely to fit the majority of people well. Just know that as you advance, you can tweak that sequence if it suits you. Now before we do this, we need to make sure the main bed is now set to knit every row and the river bed is set to slip every row. That's both PR buttons on this particular machine. I'm going to use the automatic wrap, which is place this needle in the hole. I'm going to do one additional thing here. Sometimes a little hole likes to develop right where this starts. I'm going to quell that tendency by lifting the row below and making it share the front bed needle. For the next steps, we need to make sure the main bed is set to hold when we push needles forward. So off to your left where you cannot see, I did that. So we, this needle is in hold. And then across. I'm going to do the same thing that I did on the other side. Pick up that stitch and hang it. I'm not moving it off its existing needle, just adding it. Alternative to that is taking the main yarn and wrapping it around the end needle. But this time I chose to do what you've seen me do. End hold. We're really up close now, so the end stitches are disappearing from your view. But every time I knit across, I'm adding an additional one to hold. And I chose to go in close so that you could watch the heel developing. And now you can see them. Now at this point, I can see and feel that my knitting's getting loose in this area. And it needs to be controlled. One thing I can do is reach up and manually pull down. Did you see it go down? Up? Down? Let's see, I just put that in the hole. We really don't want any stitches jumping off. That's the main bugaboo of heel knitting. And move your heel weight, whatever it might be, as often as you need to, to keep control of the matter. 
I'm going to short row down to six. This is called short rowing in or short rowing down. So on my last row, I'll put one in hold. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There are still eight working. Seven. I'm going to move my weight. Did you see it pulling down better? Six in work. And now I'm going to short row out. Same row I begin placing needles back into work. across from the carriage. When you're short rowing in, you put a needle in the hold on the same side as the carriage. When short rowing out, it's opposite. Time to move my weight. Only four left to go. Back into work. And just because I really want a strong heel, at this point I am going to wrap this last needle. Oops, time to put this one at work. And wrap this one. Now it is time for the foot rows, and I need 70 of them. And if you happen to be handy with the math, you will say, no, you do not. Um, that's going to be way too long. But remember that we're only really doing half a row on the actual sock for one row on the counter. So we'll set for tubular knitting again. I'm setting it to knit to the left on the carriage and to the right on the river. One, two, three, four. So we're knitting a tube now, a sock that will not require any seams. I'll see you when I hit 70. The majority of sock knitting patterns, including mine for machine knitters, assume that you're going to knit the heel exactly like the toe. And if we wanted to do that, we would now short row on these needles, just as we did for the toe, and Kitchener it closed. But I'm going to show you the decreased heel, which comes out the exact same size and shape, so you can substitute it on a classic pattern and it is included in the Sockinations book to remind you. We're going to decrease one on each edge of each bed and then we were going, we're going to knit four rows on the counter. One, two, so that's really one total round. Three, four. and repeat until the last row is six stitches wide same as the heel was six stitches wide so I will keep doing this and you will rejoin me when I am down to the narrowest part of the toe Okay, here we are. We've knitted on six stitches on each bed. I'm going to break the yarn, leaving a tail. As I still choose to Kitchener the seam shut, but there are only six stitches to Kitchener. So one nice thing is if you're trying to learn, but you're finding Kitchener challenging, you can get your feet wet this way. When it's not all the way across the top of the foot, it can be a little bit less daunting. And now I'm going to scrap off, still in tubular knitting, on a strongly contrasting piece of yarn. Oh, 
I want enough to tuck inside the sock. I'm recycling an odd end and holding it in my hand. Now I'll just drop it off the machine. I wasn't feeding through the yarn feeder. So let's have a look at our two socks. They look like they're going to match up pretty well. All right, let's tuck this in. The reason I wanted it to contrast sharply with the main yarn, which is tricky because this main yarn is multicolored, is that I can see so easily where to stitch. While we're at it, have a look at the decreases. I really like that because using the simple decrease there actually reinforces a wear area of the toe, but is still very neat. So here's the yarn tail I left myself, and it goes into your needle. This is the last stitch. So we we'll go across the toe to the first stitch on the other side, and I come up through it. And I'm going to come up through the one on this side. That starts us off. From now on, the action is down, up, down, up. It's a little tricky with multicolored yarn because look at this stitch. White on this side, gray on this side. And we're going to work into the stitch we worked into last where I came up, down, and come up from the bottom of the next stitch over. Then cross the toe, down, and we've got multicolored Harlequin half and half stitches all across here, but only a few of them so we'll live. You can see where we came up, and this is the actual end of the stitch. This is the side of the stitch, and I find it easier to go down there and across and up through this one. I'm making sure I'm doing the right thing down through this one. Even though it's tedious for me to do it on camera and for you to watch, I think I'm going to do all of it in front of you so you can really see it come together. Every stitch is an opportunity for me to turn and twist just a little. There is a stitch. Part of it's behind the teal. And for you to see what you're looking at. I think it was Laura Kinnan that finally made me understand this. It's not intuitive. At least not for most people. What she said that helped me, that I will repeat to help you, is just remember you work into every stitch twice. So this one's been worked into, down, up, first time for this next stitch. Second time, first time. Second time. First time. Try very hard not to split any of your waist yarn. You can get things back to normal if you do, but it's just a little trickier. At the very end, things get tight. That was the last stitch I worked into. I think that is the other half of it. Down, up, and this one's been worked into once, so we're done once I go back into it. However, 
of course, you just can't snip the yarn here. You've got to secure it. So what I do, let me just put this here so it doesn't run away from us. I go to the inside. Get this stuff out. We did a nice job because it pulled right on out. Now I'll push my needle through, weave it in and out of some of these stitches, and then snip it off. So here we are double checking that everybody's secure, and they are. Go down any convenient nearby place. Just making sure that I don't cause the yarn to back out of a stitch that I just finished closing. As you know, I am, unlike some knitters, willing to knot on some occasions. That is not the yarn. This is not one of those occasions. I'll weave it to and fro, but there isn't a whole lot worse than a knot right in the toe of your sock, unless it's on the heel of your sock. So I do not mind that what I'm doing, weaving to and fro, will thicken the toe of the sock a little, but I sure would not want a bump of any kind. What you've just seen me do, though, is enough that there's no likelihood whatsoever this area will back out, so I'll just snip it off. Here are our two socks. This is the one I had made before you joined me. This is the one we made together. Um, they're a beautiful match as far as the patterning goes. They're, I cannot claim entirely all the credit for that. I did a good job, but if the manufacturer does not get their dye intervals even, nothing you can do will cause it to happen. So the manufacturer did a good job too. And I am really sorry to tell you, you can't get this yarn. I think I bought the last of it in the U.S. on a clearance at a yarn store. Um, but you can get similar yarns, and I'm sure you'll enjoy them. And you know how to seam the sock. The way we did this, with a quarter of the stitches being moved in each at a time, the seam is at the center back. Another perfectly traditional way to do it is for the seam to end up the side. But I prefer to do it this way because it's easier to move a quarter of the stitches than half of them, and I really prefer the seam up the back myself. It's a very nice fitting sock. Here's a closer look at the decreased toe on the foot. And here is the Sockinations book that I mentioned to you during this video.